1231, so that means we are one minute over. So we'll have to go quick. Now, welcome back. We are continuing our study of Genesis. We're in the middle and thick of the Joseph novel. And last week, where did we end? Well, I know chapter 42, but which <laughs> That is correct. What was happening last week, because there are people here today that were not here last week, so we've got to catch them up. What had happened? Yeah, Joseph's brothers went down to Egypt to get food. What else had happened? Yeah, he hid himself, or he disguised himself, or he actually just looked so different because he was Egyptian and they were not used to seeing him. The last time they'd seen him was like what, 13 years before? So how did it how did it go down? Did he greeted them with open arms and they ran towards each other crying and hugging. What did he do? What do you do? It's not a trick question. What do you do? <laughs> he pretty much called the thieves. Yeah. Yeah, he gave them a little bit of a rough reception. Accused them of being spies and, and kind of, you could, you, could, you can understand why after being sold into slavery by your brothers and thought to be long gone, you would want to maybe, maybe ward it over a little bit, maybe make them sweat some uh, when you first meet. So it's understandable, but there's even more going on. We're going to see that he's actually testing them. He's testing their motives. He's testing their uh, their loyalty, their honesty, their love for one another. And in the next chapter, not this one today, but the next one, he'll even test their faithfulness regarding his full brother, Benjamin. So Joseph is, there's sort of a feeling out process. And you see he's not in a hurry to reveal himself immediately. So he sends them away uh, saying what? Yeah, bring this younger brother you told me you have. I want to see if you're lying. I want to see if you're making all this up. If you're not a spy, um, bring me back your other brother. And then I'll let your brother who I've kept, Simeon, I'll let him go. So he kept one of them a slave and he sent the others back. And they go back to Jacob, and what's Jacob's response? There was no way you sent some brother. Yeah, like, no, you, I've already lost one of Rachel's sons, my favorite wife, my favorite son. Why would I risk losing the other one, even at the cost of Simeon's life? So you see there's still this, this favoritism element going on in Jacob, and, and he's just determined not to lose the last remnant he has of Rachel, um, which would be Benjamin. So they stayed, and, uh, and he basically says, you know, no, I'm not, I can't. That'd be too much for me to lose Benjamin after all of this. In chapter 43, we pick up, it says, now the famine was still severe in the land. This is two years into this seven-year famine. <clears throat> so when they had eaten all the grain they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, go back and buy us a little more food. <clears throat> but Judah said to him, the man warned us solemnly, you will not see my face again unless your brother's with you. If you will send your brother along with us, send our brother along with us, we'll go down and buy food for you. But if you not send him, we will not go down because the man said, you will not see my face again unless your brother's with you. Israel, which is Jacob, asked, why do you bring this trouble on me by telling the man you had another brother? They replied, the man questioned us closely about ourselves and our family. Is your father still alive? He asked us, do you have another brother? We simply answered his questions. How were we to know he would say, bring your brother down here? Then Judah said to Israel, his father, send the boy along with me, it was Benjamin, and we will go at once so that you and your children may live and not die. I myself will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him here before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. As it is, if we'd not delayed, we could have gone and returned twice already. So what's Judah offering to do here? What's he, what's he saying? What's his solution? Hmm? 
Yeah, he's, he's basically putting up assurance and saying, I guarantee I'll bring him back. And he's taking the blame upon himself. Um, there's, there's a willingness we see in Judah. The Judah that we last saw in chapter 37, 38 uh, is not the same Judah as now. There's been a change in him. Or there's, there's something he is actually acting like the leader of the clan should act. He's, he's acting um, in a way that's bringing honor rather than shame to his family. And he's also willing to take upon himself the punishment should his mission fail. That's an interesting key to note. Because Judah is the tribe from which the king will come. And the king's job ultimately was to take the burden of the nation upon himself. But even more significant theologically, Judah is the tribe from which the Messiah would come. And the Messiah's entire ministry would center around taking upon himself the punishment of the people that they rightly deserve. So there's hints or echoes of faint foreshadowing of the significance of Judah and his line in this narrative. Not enough to make a case for him in terms of saying, ah, here's Jesus, but enough to say this is an interesting point. This is a, something that's going to unwrap, unroll over the next few chapters and then for the rest of the Bible. And especially in the coming chapters, it will be significant even more so. Uh, so remember that the last half, the latter parts of Genesis are focusing in on basically the characters of Joseph and Judah as the two that will go forward, that will carry forward the destiny of, of the sons of Israel. So their father Israel said to them, if it must be, then do this. Put some of the best products of the land in your bags and take them down to the man as a gift. A little balm, a little honey, some spices, some myrrh, some pistachio nuts and almonds. You know how expensive pistachio nuts and almonds are even today. So back then, even more so. Take double the amount of silver with you, for you must return the silver that was put back into the mouths of your sacks. Perhaps it was a mistake. Take your brother also and go back to the man at once. And may God Almighty, El Shaddai, grant you mercy before the man so that he will let your old other brother and Benjamin come back with you. As for me, if I'm bereaved, I am bereaved. So he just resigns himself. Jacob uh, realizes we're all going to die if this doesn't, you know, the famine's severe. If I don't risk the life of Benjamin, then we're all going to die. So let me do everything possible to, to get in this man Joseph's good graces. I'm going to load you up with gifts. I'm going to butter him up. We're going to give him honey and pistachio nuts and all this good stuff and double the silver. So we're going to return the silver that may or may not have been accidentally sent back with us because for all he knows, Joseph and Egypt may think that they robbed him or that they swindled him. They got their grain and they kept the silver that they were supposed to use to buy the grain. So he's hedging his bets. He's, he's, he's saying this is an all-out, last-ditch effort to remain in the good graces of this overseer of Egypt. So the men took the gifts and doubled the amount of silver and Benjamin also. They hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, take these men to my house, slaughter an animal, and prepare dinner. They are to eat with me at noon. So a big lunch festival. The first Ruth's Chris Bible study <laughs> is taking place. Um, the man did as Joseph told him and took the men to Joseph's house. Now the men were frightened when they were taken to his house. Because that's not a normal thing. You're, you're wandering nomads coming to bed for food to buy. And you're taken to the house of the second highest man in all of Egypt. You know, it would be like visiting America from another country and you're taken to the vice president's house for lunch. Or so, you know, it would just be odd. It would be, they'd get a little uh, nervous. So they went up to Joseph Stewart and they spoke to him. Oh, wait, excuse me. They were frightened. They thought, we were brought here because of the silver that was put back into our sacks the first time. He wants to attack us and overpower us and seize us as slaves and take our donkeys, which is a funny remark. Like the king, ruler of Egypt, needs their donkeys. Um, but you just see this franticness in them. And so the man did as Joseph told him and took them into Joseph's house. Verse 19, so they went up to Joseph's steward and they spoke to him at the entrance of the house. Please, sir. They said, we came down here the first time to buy food, 
But at the place where we stopped for the night, we opened our sacks, and each of us found his silver, the exact weight in the mouth of his sack. So we brought it back with us. We've also brought additional silver with us to buy food. We don't know who put our silver in our sacks. It's all right, I said. Don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father, has given you treasure in your sacks. I received your silver. Then he brought Simeon out to them. So here now, the, the steward, we realize that he is most likely in on all of this. As, as Joseph's trusted right-hand man, which is what Joseph once was to Potiphar, um, he's most likely in on this to some degree, or at least knows that these people are special. He may not know Joseph's identity, but he knows you know, they're going to be frantic, they're going to be worried. You know, this is what you should tell them. And so he, he tells them, he says, I got your silver, relax. God's given you that treasure back, which was true theologically. God is behind the scenes in all of this and is the one overseeing and orchestrating everything. But it's also the steward's way of um, kind of, you can see him almost kind of saying it with a wink, like, relax. We, we got your gift and that's yours from the Lord. So this would either put them at ease or freak them out or maybe a little bit of both. Verse 24, the steward took the men into Joseph's house, gave them water to wash their feet and, and fodder for their donkeys. They prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon because they had heard that they would eat there. When Joseph came home, they presented to him the gifts they had brought into the house and they bowed down before him to the ground. Once again, fulfilling the dream that he had had way back as a teenager. This time they are all bowing down because Benjamin's with them. He asked them how they were. And then he said, how's your aged father you told me about? Is he still living? They replied, your servant, our father, is still alive and well. And they bowed low to pay him honor. Again, emphasizing God is making the things that he had given in a dream come true. As he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son, he asked, is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. He went into his private room and he wept there. After he had washed his face, he came out and controlling himself said, serve the food. So even in this midst of all of this that Joseph's going on, he's not a dispassionate observer. This is his close, I mean, he hasn't seen Benjamin since Benjamin was probably a little boy. Benjamin's probably a young man by now. And, and he's seeing his brother for the first time, his full brother, not the brothers that took his clothes and sold him into slavery after throwing him in a pit, but his actual brother who he loved, who he played with as a child, um, who, who he felt that kinship with because their mother had died during childbirth. Um, this, is, this is a lot for him. And so he's overwhelmed to the point that he has to go leave so that he can weep privately. You see the emotion there that, that this is not... You know, when you see this sometimes in Bible stories, it's presented as Joseph kind of being crafty and, or, or being like magnanimous and, and it's all a fun game. But there's, there's a lot of deep emotion going on. Almost Joseph may not have even expected that he would feel that way when he saw Benjamin. <clears throat> but after he washed his face, he came out. Controlling himself, he said, serve the food. They served him by himself and the brothers by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves. Because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews, for that is detestable to Egyptians. So Hebrews and Egyptians didn't eat together, not because of the Hebrews, but because of the Egyptians. Remember, they were the ancient metrosexual, smooth-skinned, well-shaven, nicely washed city dwellers. These were gross, dirty, hairy men from the field, riding on donkeys, you know, covered in all kinds of who knows what from such a long journey. So. There's, there's an element of social graces here. You know, you don't take a homeless person and walk them right into Buckingham Palace and seat them beside the prince and the royal family. You know, there, there's, there's a distance in those societies, in, in royal societies. And so that's being preserved here. Joseph is keeping this up because he's not done yet. He still has uh, one more testing cycle that he's gonna do. He's still intent on finding out just what exactly has changed among his brothers and what's remained the same. So he's keeping it up. He's keeping up the identity of him as an Egyptian uh, noble. And they all eat separately. 
The men had been seated before him in the order of their ages, from the firstborn to the youngest. And they looked at each other in astonishment. How, how would they know who was the firstborn and the youngest? That's what they're realizing, like, wait a minute, hey, we're sitting here in our birth order. That's weird. That can't just be coincidence, because there's 11 of us. That's a pretty significant if you've got 11 people in the right order, so to speak. When portions were served to them from Joseph's table, Benjamin's portion was five times as much as anyone else's. So they feasted and drank freely with him. So they all get served, and then the youngest, contrary to all social norms, the oldest should have gotten the biggest portion, and it should have been a double portion. Now the youngest gets not a double, but five times, more than double the double portion. So they know, or they may realize something is going on here, and this is just weird. But at this point, they don't know enough to make any uh, claims. But they, you know, you're not going to turn down a good meal of fine Egyptian food. So they feasted and they drank freely. By the way, the verb drank freely is the verb for to, the same verb of, for getting drunk. Uh, so we don't know if they got hammered in celebration or not, but it's drank freely is a good translation. Uh, they most likely celebrated hard <laughs> after such a long trip. Verse 40, or chapter 44, now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Fill the men's sack with as much food as they can carry. Put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack. Then put my cup, the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest sack, along with the silver for his brain. He did as Joseph said. As morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. They had not gone far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, Go after the men at once, and catch up with them. Say to them, Why have you repaid good with evil? Isn't this the cup my master drinks from and also uses for divination? This is a wicked thing you've done. So, in ancient Egypt, one of the ways that the Egyptian magicians, soothsayers, um, they have different terms for them, but basically one of the ways that they would see into the spiritual realm was, uh, I can't remember the exact term, it's like lacanomancy. It's, it's basically, there's a cup and you fill it with a liquid and then sometimes you put in some oil or some, some something that will make, uh, like when you put oil on the surface of water, it makes bubbles and beer. And then you would look at that and, and there were ways of you know, reading that to determine the future or to divine certain things. They did it in the ancient world. They would do other things that were even weirder. There's, there's a practice that you would cut open an animal, you'd examine its entrails. If the liver was this way, that meant this. If it was this way, that meant that. There were all of these types of divination throughout the pagan world, all of these secret arts. And so Joseph is, is instilling in them, or he's telling them, you know, I'm going to take, give him my cup. We, we don't have, we see Joseph doesn't use any of these. He, God, he says God's the one that gives interpretations. But he's letting them real, he's letting them think that they have made off with the, almost the magical or the religious or the supernatural instrument of divine soothsaying. And so they're going to be in even more trouble. It's not like they just stole treasure. It's like they stole, you know, the, the most holy relic this man who's second in command of all of Egypt. So he's he's making an incredibly serious charge against them, like a, a capital offense almost. So as morning dawned, the men were sown their way with their donkeys. Go after the men, say, is this the cup my master drinks from? This is a wicked thing you've done. Verse 6, when he caught up with them, he repeated these words to them. But they said to him, why does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servants to do anything like that. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver we found inside the mouths of our sacks. So why would we steal silver or gold from your master's house? If any of your servants is found to have it, he will die. And the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. Very well then, he said, let it be as you say. Whoever is found to have it will become my slave. The rest of you will be free from blame. Each of them quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it. Then the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest. And the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. At this, they tore their clothes. They all loaded their donkeys and returned to the city. So they tore tearing up the clothes as a sign of extreme grief uh, because they realized the one person we were supposed to bring back was Benjamin. And that's who's 
belongings this was found in. So, so now we see, though, instead of, and he, he just said, whoever's, whoever's found with it, they're going to be my slave. Bring them back. This is Joseph's kind of saying, bring Benjamin back. And there's a testing of the brothers here because the rest could have gone. They could have taken the silver and they could have gone. And the last time the other brothers were, uh, basically the last time Joseph met them, all of the brothers turned against Rachel's son, him, sold him into slavery. This time they're given a chance to once again turn against Rachel's other son and go back home and save their own lives. And so there's, there's a test of their character here. Will they do to Benjamin what they did to Joseph when the chance is given to save their lives and to save their family by taking the food back? And we see that they don't. They all return together. Uh, Joseph was still in the house when Judah, when Judah and his brothers came in. There's the elevation of Judah in this. And they threw themselves to the ground before him. Joseph said to them, what is this you've done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out by divination? So he's playing up the whole uh, soothsayer divination card. What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now my Lord's slaves. We ourselves and the one who is found to have the cup. Again, Judah speaks up, taking on himself and all of the sons of Israel the punishment that was brutal rightly uh, directed only at one. So there's this vicarious sense of him taking the punishment. Again, that has theological echoes throughout the Bible. But Joseph said, far be it for me to do such a thing. Only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you go back to your father in peace. Again, he's given him an out. Then Judah went up to him and said, please, my Lord, let your servant speak a word to my Lord. Do not be angry with your servant, though you're equal to Pharaoh himself. My Lord asked his servants, do you have a father or brother? And we answered, we have an aged father, and there is a young son born to him in his old age. His brother is dead, and he is the only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, bring him down to me so that I can see him for myself. And we said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his father will die. But you told your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him what my Lord had said. Then your father said, go back and buy a little more food. But we said, we cannot go down. Only if our youngest brother is with us will we go. We cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me, and I said, he's surely been torn to pieces. And I've not seen him since. If you take this one from me too, and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. So now, if the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with the boy's life, sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father, and I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. So now we have this impassioned plea of Judah, the brother or the, the son of Jacob, who we had seen earlier in the previous chapters, who was a somewhat of a, I don't want to say a chief, but who was irresponsible in terms of leading the family, who was not willing to carry on the family line through Tamar and that whole episode, but who was willing to sleep with her uh, for his own pleasures and, and then got called on it. So you see that character of Judah and how he has changed and now has become the leader of this group of brothers. He's not the oldest. He's not even the second oldest. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, all are older than him. But he's the one who, who, throughout the narrative, is stepping up and taking this leadership role. And he's interceding. He's, he's pleading on behalf, not just of him, and not just of Benjamin, but on behalf of their father, on behalf of Israel as well. So he's elevating the needs of the family and of the family's living head of Israel, Jacob. 
and he's pleading to this foreign king. For all he knows, this this foreign not king, this foreign uh, vizier or or steward or vice regent over all of Egypt, and this pagan who uses divination and and his magical <coughs> cup and you know all of this stuff. That's who Judah's pleading to, not realizing the entire time that it's Joseph, the other son of Rachel. So he, uh, he, he the text here is it's this heightened sense. He's retelling. He's coming clean. He's basically letting Joseph in on what Joseph already knew. But for the sake of the reader, we're seeing him recount the story and plead for the life of, make intercession for the life of. His brothers. So we see Judah as an intercessor. And again, that's going to have an incredible significance for the one who will come forth from the tribe of Judah as being the ultimate intercessor. So, come back next week. We'll leave it there at the height of the drama. Uh, we'll see Joseph's response. Most of you know how the story ends, but we're going to leave it with a little bit of tension. We're right on time, so uh, if you have any questions, if you're not going to be here next week or if you've missed previous weeks, we're recording and they're online. Uh, YouTube, go to Disciple Dojo. It's one word, and that's where you can see all the videos from previous weeks. Lastly, this announcement, this Thursday, starting this Thursday, so day after tomorrow, um, at down at Good Shepherd Church in, in Steel Creek near Carowinds. We're going to start, I'm going to be teaching a six-week course called Romans, the Letter that Changed the World. It's going to be a six-week study on the book of Romans, the, the overall theme and the overall theology of Romans. I think it's only $15 for all six weeks, uh, but you have to register online at Good Shepherd's website. Uh, child care is provided if you register, and uh, I would love to see you all there. There's plenty of space. And so if you have questions about it, ask me or go to gsumc.org, goodshepherdyallmethodistchurch.org, and you can register for the class. All right, have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.